Okay, all right. So uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, come to the seat uh, And today we have a speaker, uh, our speaker, Huan Ching Chen, uh, who, is, who recently joined CEDA uh, as a new postdoc as an CEDA fellow. And Huan Ching is an expert on modeling uh, and cosmic reionization process at a uh, very high redshift. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, quasar activity today and how quasar uh, affects the uh, EOR history, as well as galaxy formation and uh, properties of the intergalactic medium. And Huan Ching got her uh, undergrad degree from Ninth University, uh, Bachelor of Astronomy, and then she moved on uh, to the University of Chicago and got her uh, PhD degree uh, under the vision with, uh, of Nick Netting. And uh, she received, uh, in year 2019, she received the Future Investor Award from NASA. Uh, and now she uh, start her postdoc uh, at CETA. Uh, okay, so let, let's welcome Huan Ching and uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Huan Ching, I'm a new CETA postdoc here. My office is right at the opposite corner of the seminar room. So also next, right next to the construction site. So next time, if you want to check the status of the room transformation project, please also drop by my office and we can also talk about science projects. Um, yeah, so today I would like to talk about uh, cosmic ionization and what we can learn about cosmic ionization using a brand new observable called the Quasar Proximity Zone. And I was I will start with the introduction of cosmic ionization and the Quasar Proximity Zones. So uh, particularly, what are the Quasar Proximity Zones? And by the way, for a spoiler, this is one real data of this proximity zone in a quasar spectra. And I would also, I will further discuss three uh, topics. And first is the, how to interpret the size of the proximity zone. And the second is how we could use it to probe the IGM at that distant universe. And in the last part, I will switch gear a little bit to talk about how gas formation is impacted in the proximity zone under intensive quasar radiation. And I will end with a, a future prospect. So just to bring everybody on the same page, here I'm showing the history of the universe. Uh, we know that our universe starts with a big bang and in the very first 400,000 years, the universe is very hot and the gas is uh, in a mostly ionized state. As the universe expands, the gas will cool down and then the protons will recombine with free electrons to form the cold uh, neutral hydrogen. And our universe enters this so-called dark age. As time passes by, gravity pulls matter together to form the first luminous objects like the stars, galaxies. And then they emit ionizing photons to ionize the gas again and bring about the second uh, epoch where the universe is mostly in uh, ionized states. And hence the term cosmic reionization comes from. Uh, our current understanding of reionization still mostly comes from simulations. And the simulations has predicted that this reionization process is a very complex patchy process. It's usually starts with over dense region where there are more galaxies and these galaxies emit a lot of ionizing photons and create ionized bubbles and these bubbles grow larger and larger and finally overlaps. So simulations are mostly agreed on this, but there are more fundamental questions. For example, when did the first galaxies form? And when did the first quasar form? Uh, form and then more intrins uh, intriguously, what are the quasar? What are the quasar environments look like? How could this uh, central supermassive black hole grow to ten to the nine solar mass within just the one big year of the universe? Is still very much open questions, and hopefully in the next few years we will see new data from JWST that can push our observational frontier to higher redshift and allowing us to learn more about this epoch. Uh, after this 
cosmic organization, uh, we more or less know that our universe is in a mostly ionized state, and there are only a tr trace of residual neutral gas left. Uh, how do we know the ionization state of the, our universe? Uh, one of our most powerful tool is from the absorption, uh, lemma alpha absorption from distance quasar. Here I'm showing an uh, il uh, illustration made by Andrew Posen, illustrating the formation of lemma alpha forest which is very common at Russia three. So here is the intrinsic quasar spectra. Here is the permanent Lyman alpha line. And as this pack, packet of photons traveling towards us, they will encounter some neutral hydrogen. And whenever um, this um, packet of photon encounter this neutral hydrogen, they will create some Lyman alpha absorption at this arrest of friend 1216 Armstrong. And because the uh, because the lima alpha uh, line is a resonant line, they have large. It has large cross section. This means that tiny amount of neutral hydrogen can create significant absorption lines. And so the fact that uh, what we see at ratio three is uh, lima alpha forest actually means that the universe is already very ionized up to ten to the minus five because above that we won't see this absorption, but we won't see this uh, apparent continuum, but they will be uh, mostly absorbed, what, which we will see in the next slide. And this Lima Alpha forest is very good for people who study cosmology and the uh, gas formation because this looks, this acts like a 1D scan of the gas content of the universe. So we, by analyzing these features, we can decode many fundamental properties of the gas, like the density, temperature, and also further ionizing background of the universe, which are all very important for us to constrain cosmology or gas information. Um, here I'm uh, showing some typical quasar, -like, uh, qu quasar spectra sorted by their redshift. And Immediately, you can see that uh, towards higher redshift, there are more and more absorption. And this reflects this uh, higher neutral fraction and also lower ionization background. And this picture will look quite different at redshift six because simply because the ionization background is so low and there are more neutral fraction. So instead of a, a parent a continuum here, you, it looks more like a transmission spikes instead of the absorption lines on top of a continuum. And more typically above Russia six, you will see complete absorption called the Gampitan Chow. And this means that this saturated Lima Alpha is not a good news uh, for people who want to understand realization Alpha because once the uh, lines start to saturate, you, you can't do much about how to like, probe the density or temperature. But um, there are some special regions you can still get unsaturated lemma alpha absorption. And this is in the quasar proximity zone. Um, because the quasars are so bright, once they turned on, they can immediately reduce the neutral fraction around them further. Um, so that the uh, lima alpha uh, absorption won't be saturated here. And with our current facility, we can already get very high resolution spectra from this non-zero tra non -zero transmitted box region. And usually for a bright quasar, this region can be very large, up to dozens of co-moving mag parsecs. And the, such facility like TAC and VLA, a VLT obtain very high resolution spectra and you can see these compact features here, very much resemble the Lima Alpha forest at low redshift. And this means that we can actually do a lot of interesting science using this uh, data, but uh, currently it's not really exploited. 
so this brings uh, us to the first point why the study prosmetism is so important because this is the only place we can find unsaturated lemma alpha that allows us to do uh, science like probing the large scale structure at realization. And the second point is that quasars are thought to live in over dense region. And uh, we know that uh, massive uh, halos seem, uh, tend to cluster together. So an analogy that I to uh, use is that the quasars are really like lighthouse in the distant universe. Not only could we um, study the intervening IGM by analyzing their spectra, but we can use their position to chase other high redshift galaxies. And this save us time, save us observation time, so we can better uh, plan to target uh, overdense region and find the first galaxies. And also the proximity is such a, sure. As you know, people are searching for binary supermassive black holes in nearby galaxies mm. with relatively weak um, activity. Is it possible in principle to see evidence of binarity in these uh, very strong Lyman alpha emission lines at high redshift? Binarity, you mean the double like supermassive both yes. I call them both to be accreting significantly. Yeah, so we have already observed two quasars at very close distance, but it's not like they are in the tight orbit. It's like a KBC scale. This is the observation we have. It's only one that we observe. At high redshift, you're not going to be able to resolve the two separation, I would think, the separation between the two quasars, but you might see a, a, a an imprint in the in the emission line spectrum in principle. Yeah, so that is possible, but I, I don't think that, that is possible, but I definitely think uh, the way in that indicates that. And yeah, okay. So, and also the quasar proximity zones are uh, such regions that uh, there are so many interesting physics, uh, physics going on and it's a very interesting region to study the interplay between quasar galaxy and IGN. And in this talk, I would like to explore uh, three topics. The first one is that it's about the size of the proximity zone. So whenever we get this, data, the first properties we will measure is the, the easiest one just to measure the size of these zoom, proximity zones and what, how can we interpret it, this size? And second, I would like to talk about what can we do with these subtle features in this proximity zone. And in the last part, I will switch here to talk about the galaxies. Yeah. Yeah, so first, how do we interpret the size? So I'm a, uh, I'm a theorist, so I will probe this question first in our simulation box. So the simulation I'm using is the CROC simulation, stands for uh, Cosmic Randomization on Computers, and we have run a lot of boxes, and because the code is, we are using our code, which is adaptive mesh refinement, this allows us to go down to a resolution of 100 parsec to actually um, resolve the galaxies. And in the simulation, we include gas heating, cooling, stellar, uh, star formation, stellar feedback, and also the radiate transfer is fully coupled. So we can self consistently model the neutral fraction evolution too. And the simulation, the uh, Fiducial simulation do not have any quasars as individual ionizing source. So to model the uh, proximity zone spectra, what we do is using post-processing. So I will 
save a lot of snapshots at different redshifts and then identify massive payloads as the quasar hosts and then randomly draw sidelines centered on them and post-process them with a quasar spectra. Uh, so here is some technical details, just uh, in case some of you may wonder what exactly the post-processing is doing. So here I'm showing an example sideline uh, from the quasar away from the quasar. This is the density field, and this is the in initial ionization fraction field. And sh this curves showing the hydrogen helium one and helium two ionization uh, fraction. And th the code will take the input from the quasar spectra and then pass to the first cell and adaptively um, calculate the neutral fraction. And then simultaneously it will uh, output the transmitted spectra and uh, put it to the next cell as the input, so, so on and so forth. So here I'm just showing a movie how this certain uh, cell change in both hydrogen and helium ionization fraction and the transmission uh, spectra. And you can see that uh, uh, initially there will be some uh, heavy attenuation at this ionization potential. Uh, and then as the quasar start to shine, uh, this uh, neutral fraction will reduce and then the transmitted spectra will become like a completely similar to this quasar spectra. And the reflected onto this whole sideline, you will see an iPhone moving far away. And this code is using uh, adaptive time step two. So it has high temporal resolution, which will help us resolve these tiny clumps better so that uh, we can more authentically model this proximityism. Mm, it, it doesn't matter because what we see is just one slide from the quasar. Uh, so here is it's just the ionizing uh, flux. And then for the lemma alpha absorption spectra, it's just like using the standard like 40 profile of each pixel. So, yeah. Oh, so the, what, what's the mass of what? Oh, oh so, so up to a uh, hundred parsec spatial scale. Yeah, that does. The best we can do for now. So that corresponds to the Oh, so that's that's basically the gas around the halos. It, it, so the halo resolution is like uh, seven times ten to the six solar mass, and I yeah. And here, so what we really interested in is the transmitted the lima alpha absorption. So here I'm showing uh, how it looks like corresponding to each quasar uh, lifetime. I rush, uh, and this is the neutral fraction. So here I also uh, mark the zoom, proximity zone size by red. So observationally in practice, we define the size of the proximity zone by uh, the distance to the point where the smooth the spectra drop below some certain uh, threshold, oftentimes 10%. And here I will click through to show how this proximity zone size change. And you probably notice that the initially the proximity zoom size uh, increased rapidly with the position of the eye front. And then it will stop growing. And this is simply because it has reached the maximum size. And because far, farther and farther away from the quasar, the radiation is reduced as a, at least of, as a function of R to the minus two. So farther away from the 
uh, quasar, there are just not enough ionization uh, intensity to bring this transmitted flux up, up uh, above this threshold. So it will stop growing. So in summary, in a, uh, new, uh, in a, for the case when the quasar is turned on in a neutral IgM, which is mostly likely the case at redshift eight, um, the size of the proximity zone will increase in the first uh, um, 10 million years. So here I'm showing the uh, size of, this is the physical size uh, defined as the eye front to the quasar and this red line is the observational size and this scatter is all the uh, 2000 of cyanides I, in my simulation. And we can find that initially the proximity zone, observational proximity zone size increase with quasar lifetime. And we can, that means that we can use the size measurement to actually constrain the quasar lifetime on this uh, time scale, which will be very interesting for uh, simulators who study the uh, growth of um, of this supermassive black hole. Yes. Could you say a little bit more about the structure? The structure that was emerging. Oh. So. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you see the kind of request going up and down. Yes. Now, is this sort of uh, an effect of random velocity? Uh, no, it's mostly it because of the large scale structure, which I will talk about in the next part. Well, I, I, I guess one of the later questions is that, of course, you know, get far enough away to say that mm -hmm. the velocity that these orbital spectral rays are is largely determined by the other. Mm -hmm, yes. But close enough in. Yeah, close enough in. This is a very in interesting region that would be uh, mostly uh, related to the quasar activity up to I think this scale. This, this is yeah one meg physical meg scale. So we should think then that larger this is. It's not really related. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the uh, yeah up to from. From one to infinity. Yes, right. I should mention that because this distance basically, I just translate this wavelength by using some Hubble law and uh, get this distance. Um, so, and up about 10 uh, million years, this observed the size stops to grow. And this is mostly because it has reached the maximum. Yes. Yeah. yeah. This is the strongest trail. This is uh, measured some, as I showed the previous is measured. So the strongest is growing, but then yeah. uh, this, this will not stop, but this will because simply because far away from the quasar, the, the lima alpha are all saturated because the radiation field drops. So there's not a strongest field. Strongest field is where the big magnetic balance. Yeah. There's no more. There's no more ionizing photons. Mm -hmm. Get out of the strongest field. Here, uh, at this point, there are still a lot of real uh, ion, uh, radiation field, but it's just not enough to bring it above the observational threshold. So, the uh signal to noise. So, so my question is following um, Yan Ching's uh, question. So, so, so the radiative ion umber density of ionizing photon is it uh, is it like a function of time? Uh, do you change the spectra evolve? Does it evolve as a so quasar spectra doesn't evolve? It's just a light bulb. Yeah, and turns on and this goes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Shall we go? Asking questions, but that's mm -hmm. So, you have uh, a nice range of scale that you are able to simulate structure. But the question then is 
can you calculate the in some part of space the average ionization fraction? Is that calculation converged in the sense that the homogeneities that are responsible for determining ionization are not right at the smallest scale? So, I mean, this, this light tracing authentically will model this fine uh, structure of this very high density clump. So, when, when it hit these clumps, it will delay a lot the speed of iPhone. So, yeah. Right. But I guess my question is are those clumps dissolved? Yeah, you know, change the resolution of the simulation. Are they always? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, this we uh, haven't really changed the max. Oh, we, we have changed this uh, in a uh, suite of like pre study of the crop simulation, and the, the uh, ionization history doesn't change. So, and then we fix this maximum, uh, uh, maximum resolution. And that's yeah. yeah. So I think the uh, resolution of the, of the simulation corresponding to that. So it's decided before that. Okay. Yeah, I think we should move. <laughs> Well, the result. So, the point is that if we observe a significant number of quasars at redshift eight, which we think believe we could do with Euclid and the LSST, um, we could use the size distribution of the quasar uh, proximityism to constrain how long this first a supermassive black hole has been accreting. But unfortunately, nowadays, most of the data comes from redshift six. So what would this what would this spectral look like? So by the way, redshift six is believed to be that the IGM is already pre-ionized by galaxies. So here I'm showing the evolution of uh, this spectra uh, at redshift six where the universe is mostly ionized as compared to this previous case where a lot of neutral gas are still neutral marked by the uh, yellow ones. So one, once the quiz are turned on in this most ionized universe, uh, what we see is a quite different picture because at that time you do the quiz are that need to spend time to ionize uh, gas again from this one to minus uh, seven, you just need to bring down the uh, neutral fraction a tiny bit. And this ionization time scale is super short. As we can see here, within 0.1 million years, this proximity zone already grows to this uh, maximum size. So this means that at ratio six, we could not just simply use the size of the proximity zone to uh, infer the quasar lifetime in the time scale of. A million years, which is the time scale the simulators are most uh, interested in. Um, however, any coin has two sides. We can actually use the fact that uh, proximityism doesn't really depend sensitively to quasar lifetime to use them to measure the property of the IGM. So this uh, brings us to the second part. So at Russia 6, from our simulations, we find that the radiation profile in this proximity zoom is very predictable. So here I'm showing the ionization, uh, ionization rate uh, contributed by the quasar and the background galaxies. And you can, as you can see, like when yeah. before the quasar turn, just when, when the quasar just turned on, there are some structures that will attenuate the ionization radiation, but because the quasars are so bright that immediately this uh, tiny neutral fraction will be completely ionized. And this gives 
gives us a completely um, uh, transparent uh, uh, prof uh, quasar proximalism in terms of ionizing uh, radiation. And this, for the mo majority of the side lines, this radiation profile will reach a perfect R to the minus two. And secondly, because ionization time scale is so short in the proximity zone, we can write down this ionization equilibrium equation. So this gamma is the radiation profile coefficient. And as we have just seen, this is very predictable. Uh, it's proportional to R to the minus two. And alpha is the recombination coefficient, which is a weak function of temperature. And temperature density relation is very fat after right after ionization. So to the first order, we can assume this to be uh, independent from gas density. And this uh, number density of neutral hydrogen is a direct observable. So um, knowing that to recover this gas density is quite straightforward, we just need to factor out the gamma and alpha. So what we do is we run a baseline model where we have uniformly uh, uniform density at causing mean, and then we calculate this observed, uh, calculate this baseline model in terms of optical of depth, and then we divide these observe, observed quantities by this uh, baseline model, so that the um, ratio of the optical depth observed optical depth to this baseline model will be equal to the density uh, square in unit of cosmic mean. And in reality, we just do is do this pixel by pixel. We divide it and take the square root and the blue line will recover the uh, true density. So here, let's just zoom in a little bit. And there are some points to mention because the gas is has some temperature. So what we recovered is some smooth the density field. And because the gas particular velocity, what we recovered is actually this ratio space like density and is more precisely is uh, the geometric mean of real space density and the ratio space density. And this weird co combination is actually because whatever optical depth we measured is in ratio space. And this is directly probing the ratio space neutral hydrogen number density, which can be written as the ratio space number density times the neutral fraction. And while this, this quantity is in ratio space, this neutral fraction is always cal calculated in the real space since the neutral fraction is de only depends on the real distance. And this method is sensitive to the gas fluctuating around the cosmic mean and the far away from the quasar because the drop of radiation from the quasar, there will be more and more saturated pixels. So this higher density region will not be fully recovered. And I have also done a pixel by pixel comparison. And here is the result of the true density uh, versus recovered density. And they agreed very well with very small scatter. And this, a result is very promising that motivates us to actually apply these methods to real data and to see what the real world looks like. So I contact the observers in the XQR 30 survey. This is a um, still ongoing survey targeting bright quasars at ratio six. And they have already a lot of uh, quasars fully observed with very high spectral resolution and the signal to noise and also accompany it with armor observation to get a very precise redshift. And this uh, orange line is one, uh, is the real spectra taken uh, by the VLT at, for this quasar. And these blue lines are the continuous estimation. And th by the way, this has a large uh, uncertainties, but uh, we have find the on average for the a sample of quasar, this uh, uncertainty will be small. And then for each uh, continuum draw, this black line is the recovery density uh, by the method I showed uh, before. And with this uh, sample of 
quasars, uh, by the way, we have now this 10 quasars, um, we can actually do some statistic about them. Here I'm showing the recovery density uh, CDF for a region uh, from here, 1.523 physical megaparsec from the quasar corresponding to uh, uh, roughly 10 commoving megaparsec away. So this CDF looks like this. And you may wonder why this CDF doesn't go to zero and uh, one at this low and the high density end. And here is mostly because the saturated pixel. So since data is not perfect, there are always um, limited signal to noise. So here we cannot fully uh, recover the high density peaks. So this level just reflects the level of saturated pixels. And here is due to the uncertainty in continuum modeling. But we have done significant tests and find that in the middle region, this is re robust against all these uncertainties in observation. And with this, we can actually use them to compare with the model to get some interesting uh, result. For example, we can use them to constrain uh, cosmology. So here I'm showing the observational data overlaid by um, a different theoretical model with different the sigma eight, uh, basically the uh, in initial density fluctuation. So the lower this sigma eight, the more heavy side like the theoretical curve because when there are no uh, fluctuation, every, every gas is just at uh, mean density. So by comparing uh, the observational data with the theoretical curves in this region, we can constrain the sigma eight. So this is a new method to do cosmology directly using the data at ratio of six, which hasn't been done before. And we have not, uh, currently we have large uncertainty and this is uh, the statistical uncertainty. And this simply because we only have 10 quasars right now. But if we can obtain all the uh, bright qu quasar spectral at ratio of six, which uh, there should be a few hundreds, we can significantly tighten this constraint. And also apart from constraining cosmology, we can also start to use them to probe the environment of the quasar. So the CDF, I'm showing the previous CDF at the router region. Well, here is the CDF in the inner region and the put them in the same slice, you can see that the inner region is significantly denser than the outer region. This is in agreement with our co common assumption that the first uh, quasars should live in an over dense region. And with this measurement, we can actually quantify the typical mass of the quasar host. And I, our constraint is 10 to the 12.5 solar mass. So a brief summary about this uh, spectral part. Um, I've shown that it, at ratio of six, where well, the IGM is mostly neutral, the proximity zone size strongly depends on quasar lifetime. So that uh, reversely, we can use the proximity zone size to constrain this uh, quasar lifetime. At ratio of six, uh, rather we can use the tiny feature, uh, interesting features in the proximity zoom to measure the IGM density field. And this um, method can help us uh, understand the large scale structure in the distant universe. And here, just a quick note about the final note about the spectra. Uh, apart from the recovering density, we can also use them to recover temperature profile of the IGN. So in our recent paper, I find that using a CNN, we can actually resolve this very, very subtle bordering of this transmitted flux to get a temperature profile. And this is actually provides a new way to constrain the quasar lifetime, even in a ionized universe, because galaxy can only ionize hydrogen, but it is not, the spectra is not hard enough to also ionize helium-2. So only in quasar can pro create such a helium-3 region where the temperature is larger. 
And when the quasar is young, this helium-3 region is small. When it's old, it's large. And here, you can probably see that the green curve is smoother here. That means that the I front of the helium-3 has passed, passed it. And by extract a uh, temperature profile, we and locating the I front, we can um, independently use it to constrain quasar lifetime, even in an ionized universe. And uh, apart from this, we can move to an um, intermediate redshift. Around the redshift seven, we believe the IgM is undergoing a rapid transition from a neutral to ionized state. And in fact, a lot of some of the quasars observed at redshift seven display this uh, damping wing like structure. And the people are starting to use them to constrain the neutral fraction. And this is what uh, the project I'm currently working on to develop a way how to accurately uh, infer the neutral fraction. So now let's switch gear to the final part. Um, uh, uh, let's talk about how gas deformation is impacted in the quasar environments. And this project is uh, more or less motivated by the recent observation. So Nowadays, a lot of there is a race to trace this quasar field and to map the galaxies around them because they also want to know what kind of environment this first quasar lived in. Because this is a, such an important question, if we want to also like fancifully model the formation of the first quasar, we need to choose a right uh, place in the cosmological simulation to put uh, to zoom in. So here I'm showing a result from the Ata et al. This is uh, from the Subaru group. This yellow square is the position of the quasar while this blue and the red, red marks are the Lyman gamma, uh, Lyman gray gases and the Lyman alpha emitters. So the quasar, quasars, since the quasars are to live over dense regions and gases is a, uh, tracer of the underlying matter distribution, naturally we expect to see more gases around those quasars. However, the observational result is quite ambiguous. For example, in this study, the quasar field looks like this and the blank field where there are no quasar look like this. It looks, it doesn't seem to be that the case that this one is over denser than this one, but it's the opposite. Well, we need to take, because there are still caveats because a lot of the observation now is from the ground-based telescope where they only have a few, have one large uh, wider uh, filter and this allows a lot of uh, contamination from different Russia, uh, from a large projection distance and also completeness is also an issue. But with the JWST, we're expecting to see a lot of improvement of it because they have much more uh, finer uh, wave band to help us clean this result. But while observers are making progress, series also contaminating. If these results are real, what can be the explanation for that? So most uh, studies, uh, a process is this called the uh, radiated feedback from the ionizing photons from the quasar. And the idea is that since the quasar emits so much ionizing photons, they will photon heat the gas around the, photon heat the gas in the halos around the quasar and this, heating will prevent the gas to fall into the halos and form stars. So that's why we, did, we don't see them. And here is a 1D simulation of that uh, uh, ionizing radiation feedback model of the quasar. So here, different curves are different uh, uh, halo mass. And then this is a delay time, like, if you put a quasar and no quasar, how, uh, how much time delay do you have for this gas to collapse into a point? So this is a 
kind of very, very idealized simulation, assuming every halo is just a scale. But to do this more uh, realistically, we should put in a simulation. So I have run a simulation to actually quantify this, pro this uh, feedback. So here I'm showing three different boxes in my suit. This one is without quasar. I'm showing the neutral fraction. The uh, yellow is the neutral, while this blue is the ionized one. So this is the, I put a fan quasar in the most massive halo, while here I'm showing, putting a brighter quasar in this halo. And this is a snapshot after 30 million years uh, when I turn on the quasar. And with this simulation, I can study the star formation history in all the surrounding halos of the quasar. And here I'm showing the result of star formation. Uh, this is the star formation history uh, of all the halos in this one physical map. From the least massive to the high, high, higher mass. And here I'm showing the around it. You can see that there is a significant suppression in star formation for these very small halos. So what is the main cause of such a suppression? And previous studies have uh, intensively studied the photon heating and we checked the temperature and gas evolution. And we find that this process in, is indeed at work. So here I'm showing the most, the least massive beam of these halos, and I'm showing the temperature uh, evolution for this no quasar, fan quasar, and bright quasar cases. And we can see that immediately after I turn on this quasar, there is a jump in temperature. In temperature, however, because this um, re reduction of gas is a dynamic process. We need to wait for roughly uh, some crossing time to, to see a re reduction of gas mass in these halos. So this is not an immediate uh, process. But what we see in the simulation is actually that the star formation rate drop immediately when we turn on the quasar. And this, is, uh, this indicates that the main process in such the suppression is from the photon dissociation of molecular hydrogen. And since the molecular hydrogen traced the star formation region, um, this is a much uh, small scale process. Instead of the ionizing radiation from the quasar, it is the lyman weiner band radiation that destruct this uh, star formation region that uh, reduce the star formation rate. And the reason that the uh, larger halos doesn't show immediate uh, suppression is because the larger halo has denser gas inside them and then they provide much more shielding for this star formation region. And reflected on the uh, luminosity function, uh, we, we find that uh, indeed uh, as expected, the higher uh, mass, uh, higher luminosity end doesn't got impacted while the small and got significantly impacted, uh, especially for the bright quasar. And here is the result after the quasar has been shining for 300 million years. And the JWST is uh, planned to observe galaxies uh, down to minus uh, 15. And if we get lucky, we can also find a, if we can also find a lens before the quasar field, we can also push down to minus 13 and this will help us better ma measure the luminosity function. And this help us to understand how the galaxy and quasar coevolution is like in this uh, reionization epoch. Cool. Uh, for... yeah, so here I'm, I didn't, I didn't put it, I just slide it up and let it evolve. No, I, it's just one. <laughs> We don't know, no. So from the low ratio, it's like, uh, it can be as low as uh, a few percent at the local universe and it goes up to 
probably 60 and ratio three. This is from the clustering measurement from SDSS. Could be long. Yes, could be long, but there's a, there's a lot of controversial in this high ratio uh, in terms of, we can discuss it later, but there is a very interesting uh, discussion on how, what is the epic uh, episodal lifetime and the integrated lifetime. So in the last slide, I'm just want to highlight the exciting future of uh, study randomization with the quasar plasmidisms. We know that JWST is taking data right now and the realization is the primary scientific goal of this uh, fantastic flagship. And in fact, uh, there are a lot of Russia six quasars targeted for this GTO and cycle one geo observation. And this will be the first data set that we can uh, start to analyze. And I'm very excited to see the observational results. And in the meantime, we have a lot of data coming from the ground-based telescopes like the CAC and VLT, and they provide very high res spectral resolution data that allows us to uh, measure the large scale uh, structure around the quasar and allows us to uh, study the interesting physics of uh, uh, quasar accretion. And also the 30 meter telescope is also highlighted by the decadal survey the US decadal survey, and they could dramatically increase the sample of quasars. And in the meantime, uh, AMA can also provide the accurate ratio for these galaxies and measure the gas dynamics, the formation rate in these galaxies. And this syn synergy of this, or this amazing telescope will help us um, learn much more about the, how the first quasars are formed and how they impact the uh, whole gas content of the universe. So here I put the conclusion. I've shown that with proximity zone size, we can probe the quasar lifetime. And with the structure, we can reconstruct the density field. And also we can use the luminosity function of the quasar field to study the feedback pro processes. And in the near future, we'll expect the evolution of high quality observational data. And this will allow us to do much more exciting science. And thank you. Speaker for a very nice talk and uh, for question or comments. Uh, Let me check the audience online. No. Oh, Raina. Hey, very nice book. Um, I have a question of a couple of numbers you didn't mention, I think. Um, what, what's the typical luminosities you're assuming, volumetric luminosities for the quasar and? So for the... For the spectra there, I use the minus, uh, minus 26.6. And then this simulation with different uh, quasars, I'm using minus 24 and minus 26. Magnitude. Uh, yeah, the magnitude. Sorry, I'm, I'm oh, so that is the usual. <laughs> 1047 rx per second uh, for this bright one. OK. Um, Analyzing. Yeah. So you're analyzing a, what is it, 150 megaparsec co-moving box, right? Oh, the simulation box, yeah. 40 co-moving. 40, okay. So obviously you don't have any, like that luminous grades in, in that kind of volume. Also, so you said uh, the the size doesn't- The, the box touch, simulates- touch the is, most massive yes. experiment. Yes, so this is a problem that all simulation currently have, but like if we think that the quasar actually live in this kind of halo, we can actually catch it with a little bit tuned DC mode. Yeah, so this is a very interesting point. What, what halo mass exactly the quasar lived in? So yeah, 
it seems like that they are not the most massive halos in the universe. And this may, might indicate that the duty cycle is actually not very large, that even the small halo will have some time um, to in, the quasars in uh, active phase and uh, averagely because they have low duty cycle, then the total observed quasar currently is as measured as now. Oh yeah, yeah, no, I'm not so worried about this part here since this is basically just analyzing uh, data. Yeah. Um, more about your last parts about the the impact on, on surrounding galaxies, uh -huh. uh, where it seems to me like if, if this quasar were to live in a denser environment, mm. the impact might be significantly different. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, so it could be, but I, we, I believe this physics acts the same. So if we scale the luminosity to this and then the halo mass, we believe the for halos of that certain mass, the um, suppression, the degree of suppression should be the same. But of course, if the whole density environment is different, then the luminosity function will be different. Yes. Um, this is a very minor question. I'm, I'm not familiar with this notation, the, uh, the P before the megaparsec. What does that stand for? Oh, just a physical, physical that parsec. And because it's kind of conversion to write it this way, most uh, cosmological work will, will, will do it in co-moving mm -hmm. So they will write a C. Okay, I see. Rainer, second question. If no one else has a question, uh, plenty. <laughs> so um, I was just wondering, like you're, you were talking like again the last part about uh, reduction in star formation mm -hmm. rate at these high redshifts. Um, I've kind of not followed that field, but if I remember correctly, like the the cut of the like the low mass cutoff of the stellar mass function of galaxies depends on on reionization essentially. Oh uh, yes, but not to tend to the nine solar mass. It's like more like below 10 to the eight, just for the uh, back reaction from reionization. Mm -hmm. yes. I was just wondering whether this like quas these quasars would have an effect. Well, on when the quasar like will impact heavier halo than just for the ga gas reionization uh, back reaction. He well, it will also impact heavier halos, but the question is, does it also impact the even lighter ones? Have you checked that or have you uh, ability to check that? Sorry. Uh, I was wondering whether there are some, there is a specific halo mass that would like form stars in pure um, stellar driven, driven oh, yeah. ionization. Well, I, was vision, I think if I, Remember correctly, it's a few 10 to the eight, and before uh, below that, we do not find a molecular gas in those halos. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, our... okay, so the way I'm thinking about this is more about whether you would see remnants at rigid zero, essentially, of regions where you don't find any significantly like any small dwarf galaxies or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely not very interesting. So direction that I'm also very interesting, so we can probably talk about it later. Yes. Is that an L-star type of halo? Oh, 12.5. This is the halo mass at the ratio of six. There will be probably 10. It will become much more. So it probably says what is they expected to have such a massive quasar? So we we expect it to actually be a higher mass, higher halo mass. Halo mass. So why such a low mass halo? It's not it's not super uh, low. It's just a little bit lower than we we think ten to the thirteenth solar mass. Oh, it's within arrows. 
that. Uh, Huan Ching again. Uh, all right. So um, thanks everyone for coming and uh, yeah, let's see each other next time.